We find peace in Him. We don't find hope or peace or comfort or any of those things in any political party. It's only in Him. And so I encourage you, uh, if you could turn me up just a hair, Chuck. I like to hear myself. I'm a little, I guess, <laughs> pride problem or something. I don't know. But, but uh, 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 it's important if you haven't already voted. Uh, many people have done early voting. But if, if you haven't, be sure that you take part in, in uh, what's going on on Tuesday. And, uh, and I'm not here to tell anybody how to vote. I'm here to tell you, uh, pray and seek the face of God and listen to his voice and, and vote uh, on Tuesday because it's important that, that you take part in the process. And, and in, the, in that process, no one knows what's going to happen. No one knows what's, who's going to be elected, but this I know. I can tell you this. we got just a hair of a ring in here, uh, Chuck. Uh, this I know, and that is that regardless of what happens, it does not change who's in charge. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's uh, Vice President Biden or President Trump who's elected. It does not change that God is in charge. That's our peace. That's our hope. That's our comfort. So, but it's important that you take part in the process. Uh, so I want you to, uh, to, to remember that. I want to, you to bow your head and pray, and then we're going to get into the, into the Word this morning. Lord, I just pray that as we look at your Word, that you'd help us. Lord, we don't, nobody here needs to hear from me, but we all need to hear from you. So God, we're asking that you would make this come alive to us, that somehow, some way, one way or another, Lord God, that you would uh, touch our lives, that you would change us, that we would say when we leave this place, surely I have heard from God today. And I just thank you for that. I'm believing you for it. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Well, tonight, uh, tonight, or this afternoon, what, what, it's morning. I'll get it right. It's a time change. It messes everything up. I did enjoy that extra hour of sleep, I must say. I, I must say. Although I woke up before the alarm, so what was the point of the extra hour? But, uh, but uh, t this morning, we are uh, finishing up our series on worship that we've called Made to Worship. Today, we're just going to be talking about extravagant worship. We're going to talk about what this means. Has anybody here ever done anything extravagant for love? Maybe you, you, you fell in love with someone and you, did, you went and spent way more money than you should have or you did some, made some extravagant effort to show them how much. Anybody ever done anything like that? Somebody, okay, what, two of us, three of us, okay. The rest of you are not romantic at all, at all, period, you know, but... You know, an extravagant act of tangible is a tangible means to express extravagant love. You do that when you, feel, when you love extravagantly. And it's a way to tell someone that they are priceless to you. It's a way to show someone that they are more valuable to, do, to you than anything else in the, in the world. And so today, we're going to look at an extravagant act of worship and, and discover what worship really looks like in us, you know. The, 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 here's the deal. Some, some people approach worship like the man who was on a business trip in another city and he decided he wanted to buy a, a, a gift for his wife. And so uh, uh, he, he, he thought, you know, after being away on this business trip, it would be a nice effort, a nice little thing to, to bring his wife a little gift. So he, so he goes to a department store and he walks in there and he goes up to the, up to the perfume counter and and he began to look for an appropriate gift. And after looking for a few uh, minutes at different items, he, he, he asked the, the lady behind the counter, he said, uh, uh, how much is, uh, is your perfume? I want to see this. And, uh, so she showed him a bottle of perfume that, that, that cost $50. And he said, well, uh, that, that, that's a bit much. That's a bit much. And so she went and got something else and returned with a smaller bottle that cost $30. And he, he said, well, you know, that's still quite a bit. And Growing annoyed, the, the clerk, you know, brought him this tiny little vial of perfume and, and it cost $15. And he, and he said, well, what, what I mean is I, I want something really cheap. Can you show me something really cheap? And she handed him a mirror. <laughs> Listen, sometimes our approach to worship is to get by with as little as possible. You know, we surrender only what we think will get us by. We, we give only what we think is necessary. We only show our love for God and, uh, only as far as we think it's required. But I'm here to tell you today, and we're going to be closing out this series by, by talking about the fact that true worship is not cheap and it is not easy. 
True worship is a lifestyle. It's not just singing a few songs and, and then listening to a sermon on a Sunday morning. It's, it's more than just following some sort of ritual. Worship is a lifestyle that we live that, that says with our very lifestyle, here am, here am I, send me. That's worship. In, in his book, The Air I Breathe, Louis Giglio writes this. He said, worship is our response, both personal and corporate, to God for who He is and what He has done, expressed in and by the things we say and the way we live. And today, I want to, what I want to do, I want to look at one of the most beautiful and awe-inspiring uh, uh, pictures of worship recorded in the New Testament. And, and this act of worship did not revolve around any, kind of, any particular style of music or, or any kind of ritual at all. It's, it's the story of one woman who risked everything to worship Jesus. Her story is told in Mark chapter 14, if you want to turn there. Mark 14, beginning in verse 3, it says this. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of the man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And in this story, we have an example of true extravagant worship and there, there are two things out of this story that I want to bring to light that, that we need to understand about extravagant worship and the, the first thing is this and it is just simply that extravagant worship is focused it's focused this woman's act of worship was focused on Jesus completely focused on Jesus Jesus at the time he was at the, at the home of a man called Simon and and as he's there, suddenly this woman walks in carrying this jar of very expensive perfume. She walks into the room and without any explanation, we're not told that she said anything. We're not told that she, she did anything. She didn't explain it, what she was doing to Jesus or anybody else. Without any explanation, she breaks the jar open, which by the way, that's how they had to open a jar of perfume. It wasn't resealable like it is today. If you were going to break it open, you broke it open and that was it. And she breaks the jar open and she pours the entire contents on Jesus's head and onto his his, his body. Matt Redman, speaking of this man's uh, this woman's action, said this. He said it was worship of a woman who didn't know the rules. You don't just walk in and do this. It was an, an unpredictable, untamed heart on a quest to see Jesus glorified. He said people in love do lots of crazy things. Sometimes they even become an embarrassment to those around them. Anybody been around a couple that embarrassed you because they were so much in love that you were just a little squeamish, a little embarrassed by it? This woman who came to Jesus that day with a jar of perfume was probably an embarrassment to every person in the room except of course, to Jesus. This woman's act of extravagant worship, the thing is, it was public. It was done right there for everybody to see. But it was not done for others to see. It was done openly so, and everybody could see what was going on, but she was not doing it for them. It was all for Jesus. Her focus was not on the circumstances surrounding the moment. Her focus was not on the people in the room. Her focus was on Jesus alone. And, and our extravagant acts of worship, they might be public at times. There will be people who will see your act of worship, but, they will, but, but those acts of worship must always be first and foremost and only for Him. Not so that people will see you and praise you. Then, then it's really about bringing attention to yourself. But there, there are times when it will be public, but it's not for the public. It's for Him. And, and, and if we do it for other people to see it, then we're motivated by pride instead of humility. You know, I'll just use a simple example. You know, if you feel led to dance before God in worship, you know, that, that is an acceptable act of worship. 
before God. The Bible talks about that all the time. But here's the thing. If you find that you're not interested in dancing before God in private and it's only in public when you have an audience, then you might want to examine your, 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 your motives there because maybe something is off. I remember uh, in a church that I previously pastored, it was actually before I pastored the church, there was a woman who was attending the church and every, day, every worship service during service, she would come down to the front and the altar and she would dance back and forth and she had this flag and she would wave this flag all over the place. And, and, uh, and people began, they were having a hard time worshiping because they were having a hard time concentrating on what they're singing, what was going on, because it was so distracting. And so the pastor and the board went to this woman and they said, listen, you know, we have no problem with you dancing. We have no problem with you waving the flag. If you want to do that, that's fine. But, but there was plenty of room in the back of the sanctuary. They said, if you want to do that before the Lord, do, do it back there because it's distracting and other people are having a hard time focusing and they're having a hard time worshiping and the woman got mad and left the church because it wasn't about being done before God it was about the church seeing her and how spiritual she was you know and it, the truth is it can be applied to any form of worship if you feel the need to draw attention to it then then the question is who are you really doing it for extravagant worship always keeps the focus on Jesus alone this woman's focus uh, allowed her to worship even though the circumstances weren't very conducive to worship. I mean, you, t you talk about circumstances that make it hard to worship. You got people standing there criticizing her, rebuking her harshly, it says, as she's performing this act of worship. And yet she was, a, she was able to focus on Jesus and her act of worship. And she did it in spite of the circumstances. It, it, pr it produced criticism and rebuke, frankly, from the very people who should have understood it. They should have been standing there saying, Ah, oh, we should have done that. We should be worshiping Jesus like this. We should be pouring ourselves out. We should have done this. But instead, they had a problem with it. Uh, and here's the deal. They had no problem. There's the, you remember, we just read it. They said, oh, we could have sold this for, for more uh, uh, than a year's wages, and we could have used that to help poor people. Well, that's great. But the, here's the thing. They had no problem with her giving everything to the poor. But they did have a problem with her giving everything to Jesus. They, what happened there? They had made working for Jesus more important than worshiping Jesus. If you get those, they're both important, but if you get those two out of order, you get those two out of, out of whack, then what happens is you become works-based and works-oriented and you forget to worship, but we start with worship. And if when we start with worship, then, then that leads to the good works and we can, we can work for Jesus, but it's in response. It's, it actually becomes an act of worship for Him. In spite of these things, this woman worshiped because that was what she had purposed in her heart. Do you worship God extravagantly even when the circumstances of your life don't seem to encourage worship? Are those the moments where it, when, when things are going the worst, when things are worst in your life, when the circumstances are bad, the finances are tough, family, you know, conflict is going crazy, when, when things are going badly, when circumstances of life are really tough, is that the moment when you pull back from Him or is that the moment that you press in and you say, I'm still going to worship Him? That's the question. When you come into His presence, whether in private or in public, do you pour yourself out in such a way that there's no longer room for self? That's worship. See, worship is not about the worshiper. It's about the one who is being worshiped. We, we forget this a lot of times, and, and I, I know we forget it because this is why you have churches, you know, that uh, people leave churches and they get upset because, uh, because the, the worship singer, the worship leader uh, changes the style of music. Well, now you've just proven that worship for you was about you and not about him. You know, I have been in, in different countries where they did different kind of music. Um, but you know what? Even though it wasn't my cup of tea, I still worshiped with them. 
I still worship with him. You, you know, we can't say on one hand, I'm going to worship God because of his greatness. And then refuse to participate because circumstances make it difficult. The focus must always remain on Jesus, not on us, not on our circumstances, and not on people around us. Second thing, not only must it be focused, but extravagant worship is costly. Extravagant worship is costly. This woman broke open her alabaster jar of pure nard and poured it over Jesus' head. Now, some of your Bibles, you have footnotes and you can see this. And you'll see that it'll tell you something along, along the lines that, that, uh, that the disciples think that it would have gone on eBay for about 300 denarii. And 300 denarii were about a year's wage for a laborer, maybe a little bit more. Now, if you translate that into today's money, even at the federal minimum wage, that would be worth over $15,000 in one offering, in one moment to pour out. In New Testament times, there, there was no such thing as, as retirement systems. There were no mutual funds, no IRAs, no 401ks. There were no savings account at the bank. There was none of those things. So this woman, I want you to understand, this was likely this woman's retirement savings. This was what she had. Had, uh, that she had been set aside in case she be became a widow, that that was what she was going to live on. It was her emergency fund, maybe even her dowry. But this was no small sacrifice that she was making. It wasn't a $50 bottle of perfume. This was a big deal. This was a lot of money. And, and she poured out a year's worth of salary in one single moment, in one act of worship. You know, this, this was no small deal. And when you begin to understand this, extravagant starts to sound like too small of a word to describe what she did. I mean, I can, I can barely imagine even performing such an act of love and sacrifice. I mean, I can barely imagine giving my entire annual salary as an act of worship in one moment to say, okay, God, here it is. A whole year's salary. Here it is. It's yours. All because I love you. I have a hard time wrap, even wrapping my mind around this extravagant act of worship. But you know what? David understood the principle that true worship is costly. He, he talks about, I want to read a story from 2 Samuel 24. It says, On the day that Gad went to David and said to him, Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ar Ar Aranya, excuse me, Ar Aranya, the Jebusite, so David went up as the Lord had commanded through Gad. When, when Aranya, <laughs> that's not how you say his name, and it's just stuck in my head. Anyway, I'm going to call him A from here on out, okay? When A looked up and saw the king and his men coming toward him, he went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. He said, what, why has my Lord the king come to his servant? Listen, this is... This is when a king shows up at your house in those days, this was probably not a good deal. Probably not a good thing. Why is the king with all of his court and the regalia and all of these things showing up at my house? Have I done something wrong? Has somebody reported something falsely about me? This could be bad. So he's obviously curious. David answered him. He said, to buy your threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. He said to David, let my Lord, the king, take whatever pleases him and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering and here are the threshing sledges and the ox yokes for wood. O king, uh, I give you everything. I give all this to, to the king. And he also said to him, may the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to him, no, I insist on paying you for it. I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. I like the way the translation, which is a paraphrase. That's not a great study Bible, but it's a paraphrase. But I like the way he rephrased this, that verse in 24, that he said, I'm not going to offer to God my God sacrifices that are no sacrifice. I'm not going to offer to God sacrifices that are no sacrifice. You know, we, we often try to do that. We try to give God sacrifices that are no sacrifice. You know, we, we offer God what we do. We, we say, I'm going to give him my time, but we give him our, our leftover time. We give him our leftover energy. We give him our leftover resources. We're like, we're like the post-Thanksgiving Christian. We, all we're doing is surviving on leftovers. 
We give up what's left over. But our extravagant acts of worship must cost something, whether it's time or money or pride or, or our very life. You know, I, there was, I remember a time many, many, many years ago, I was talking with an associate pa- pastor who was uh, working with the youth at the time. And I remember, I don't remember what we were talking about, but I remember in this conversation, the subject of sacrifice came up. And I, I remember in that conversation, I looked at him and I said, I said that I said, I don't believe that that people are willing to sacrifice anymore. That's what I said. And as soon as I said that, the Holy Spirit came and he and he checked me. He checked me in that moment. And this is what he said to me. He said, That's not true. Everyone sacrifices something. The problem is that many people in the church in America are willing to sacrifice. For the wrong things. We're all willing to sacrifice for something. We're all willing to do that. And, we, and what we end up doing is we end up often sacrificing eternal things for temporary things. We sacrifice our, our children's spiritual life for, for school activities. We sacrifice our own worship for co- convenience and comfort. We sacrifice things that really matter for things that don't really matter. It's not a matter really, in a, honestly, it is not a matter of whether or not we're willing to sacrifice. It's truly a matter of priorities. The question is not, will I sacrifice? The question is, what am I willing to sacrifice for? Because true worship will cost me everything. True worship is laying down my life. It's giving God all, all that is me. That's what worship is. True worship calls for sacrifice. Sacrifice of my life. Sacrifice of my personal time. Sacrifice uh, of, of everything that I have in me. The true worship calls for sacrificing the convenient for the call of God to touch the lives of people, to, to be His witnesses, to, to carry this gospel to the whole world, to love the unlovable, to serve when I don't feel like serving, to pray when I don't feel like praying, to talk with that hurting person on the phone when I have a million things that I need to get done, to take the time to be caring and gentle with that extra that child that just needs a little bit of extra attention the one that everybody else just gets ignored at but but you're saying I'm going to take the time or or to be there for the single mom when when she's feeling completely overwhelmed and just doesn't know what to do or to walk through the recovery process with the person who's been chained to an addiction for so long that they've given up hope and they don't know what what they're going to do and they've given up hope of ever being free or or to walk the road of brokenness with the person who's life has been shattered by the death of someone they love but and they don't know if they're ever going to stop hurting true worship says yes to god no matter what he calls us to do true worship commands talent and giving and obedience and effort and diligence all throughout my days true worship here's the hard part for us because this goes against everything especially in our american culture True worship will cost me my self-centeredness. I have to lay that on the, sac- on the altar of sacrifice. I can't let my life be centered on me if I'm going to worship God. I can't let everything revolve around me and my preferences if I'm going to worship God. I can't plan my life based on what I want if I'm going to worship God. Now listen, I know this is, this is not a popular message in today's society, but, but it is the true call of God. Here's the gospel. Here's the truth of what the Bible says. Fo- follow, listen, following Jesus is not just a simple prayer and then you go about your life and do whatever you want. That is a, that is a false gospel. That is not what the Bible says. Following Jesus costs us everything it's laying my life down for him that's what worship is it's a daily act of laying down my life it's a it's a constant call to crucify my will and to pursue his will true extravagant worship means that i allow myself to be broken and spilled out like the perfume in that alabaster jar you know the the men in, in, the, in the room balked at the price of the woman's worship. We read that a moment ago. They said, what a waste! 
What a waste, they said. There, there was so much potential in that jar. We could have done so much with the money if we just sold that jar of perfume. All the things that could have happened if it hadn't been wasted on Jesus. That makes me think of people like Lillian Trasher. Some of you may know or may have heard of Lillian Trasher. She was born in Florida, grew up in Georgia. In her teens, through Bible reading and, and Bible studies at a friend's house, she chose to make a personal commitment to, of her life to Jesus Christ. And while, while in her late teens, she attended a Bible college for one term and, and then worked in an orphanage in North Carolina. She received the infilling of the Holy Spirit at a second Bible school in South Carolina and then pastored a Pentecostal church. Well, Lillian Trasher was only 10 days away from her wedding date when she broke her engagement to Tom Jordan. You know why she broke her engagement? It's because she felt a call by God. She felt called by God to go to Africa, and he didn't. And she said, if I'm going to worship my God, I do what he says. In that same year of 1910, she defied her family's wishes and sailed to Africa with less than $100 in her pocket. Her sister Jenny accompanied her and was a valuable companion through decades of work overseas. After arriving in, in, uh, in Asyut, uh, Egypt, which is about 230 miles south of Cairo, after a period of few months, a man came to the mission house where, where Lillian was residing, and, and he walks in and he tells them, he, that, he tells everyone there that there's a dying woman nearby that needs, needs to be seen. So Lillian and, and, and an older woman who was there from, from Egypt, whose name was Selah, she went to see the woman. And shortly after the company arrived, the, after they arrived to see the woman, the, the woman passed away. An elderly woman who was there was holding this malnourished baby, just barely clinging to life. And when the elderly woman spoke in Arabic, the translator told Miss Trasher that the old woman was planning to throw the baby into the great river Nile after they left because she had no means to care for the child. At the thought of that, Lillian Trasher could not leave this baby with her grandmother, so Lillian named the, the little girl, for, girl Fereda and thus began an orphanage. And by the turn of 1918, her orphanage family had grown to 50 children and eight widows. Lillian Trasher worked for 50 years from 1911 to 1961 without a furlough, without a break. By the time of her death in 1961, the Lillian Trasher Orphanage had grown to some 1,200 children. You know what? There were plenty of people who told Lillian Trasher that she was wasting her life. She gave everything she had to Jesus in Egypt as an act of extravagant worship. She took her bottle, broke it, and poured out the contents as an offering for the Lord. What was a waste in the eyes of people was an act of extravagant worship in the eyes of God. Many of you have heard of Jim Elliott. Elliott arrived in Ecuador on February 21st, 1952 with the purpose of taking the gospel to Ecuador's Wadoni uh, Indians. Elliot and four other missionaries, Ed McCauley, Roger Udarian, Pete Fleming, and then their pilot, Nate Saint, they made contact from their airplane with the Wadani using a loudspeaker, and, and they had a basket that they would hang down from a rope, and they, would, they found a way that if they did a circle with the plane that the basket would stay stationary, and they put gifts down there trying to make contact with this very, uh, very violent uh, uh, tribe that nobody had been able to make contact with. Well, after several months of that, the men decided to build a base a short distance from the Indian village along the Kurere uh, River. They were approached one time by a small group of Wadoni, Wadani, oh, excuse me, Wadani and, uh, and even gave an, uh, an airplane ride to one curious uh, man that, whom they just nicknamed George. Encouraged by these friendly encounters, they, they began to plan a visit to the Wadani. And without knowing that uh, at the time while they were planning this, they didn't know that George had gone back and had lied to the others and told them uh, that they had different intentions. And their plans were thwarted by the arrival of a larger group of about 10 Wadani, Wadani uh, warriors who killed Elliot and his four companions on January 8, 1956. Elliot's body was found downstream along with those of the other men and he was only 28 years old. 
His journal entry for October 28, 1949 expresses his belief that the call of God in his life was more important than his life. And he wrote this, and you probably heard this quote. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Some would say, what a waste. What a waste, a 28-year-old man, what a waste. And yet he gave his everything to Jesus in Ecuador as an act of extravagant worship. He took his bottle, broke it, and poured out the contents as an offering to the Lord. What, the, what was a waste in the eyes of people was an act of extravagant worship in the eyes of God. Makes me think of a man named Victor Plymeyer. Probably very few have heard of Victor Plymeyer. Victor, along with his wife and child, sailed for Tibet in February 1922 to tell them about Jesus. He was an Assembly of God missionary, one of the earliest missionaries that the Assemblies of God ever sent out. Well, in 1927, smallpox broke out in the village where they were living. And within a week, the Plymeyer's little son named John who suddenly became very ill with fever and pain. And at first, Mr. and Mrs. Plymeyer did not guess the nature of the, Ill the illness, but very soon their fears became fact because the little boy had smallpox. The pox began to show up. What followed is told by a lonely, heart Britain, br heartbroken missionary in a letter to a sister in America. I want to read part of his letter. He, said, he wrote this, During the next three days, there was some fever and pain. We were always con comforted in prayer but the sickness did not leave him on the third day the smallpox appeared leaving dark uh, tur excuse me turning dark almost immediately we prayed so earnestly for the dear little boy but jesus wanted him during the first seven days of the child's illness my dear wife never spared herself we prayed together we watched together on the seventh day she had to give up the smallpox had broken out on her also my dear wife and little boy lay there in separate rooms I did all I knew for them. I would pray for, with one, then with the other. When I could get away a few moments, I would go and cry to God, but our loving Father let me know His will for them. My heart was broken, yet I did not give up. I hoped and pleaded till the very last. On January 20th at 8 a.m., Jesus took our boy to be with Him. John was so patient during those days. He always helped me so nicely as I bathed him and changed his clothes. Then he would ask me to tell him stories. He, he never tired of listening to the stories of Jesus and Samuel. In soft, sweet whispers before he went to be with Jesus, he told me he loved Jesus. A little later, he said softly, Daddy, Jesus loves me. I have no more pain. That was the last he said. Then he was gone. How should I tell my wife what had happened? But God helped me, and a little later I helped her into, the, into his room to have one last look at little John. Then after assisting his wife back to her room, Mr. Plymire returned to his son's room to prepare the body for burial from unfinished boards. He nailed together a small box, and then with a heavy heart, the father lifted the frail boy from the bed and placed him in the crude casket, and with his own hands, he nailed down the lid. There was an anti-foreigner atmosphere that was prevalent at the time, and so no one would sell them, this foreign missionary, a, a burial plot. So finally, with a bitter ache in his heart, Mr. Plymeyer dug a small grave, and the ground was frozen. He could only get it certain, so deep, but he dug a small grave in the garden beside his house. His letter continued. While a short service was being held in the front yard by a Christian Chinese, my dear wife and I stood by, our hearts crushed, that I helped lower our dear little boy into the grave. After this, I was with my wife constantly. During these last days, many were the times I would kneel by my wife, and together we would pour out our hearts before the Lord. On the morning of January 27th, we had our last little talk. We read together from the Word. We sang our last hymn together, My Anchor Holds. She asked me to help her sit up, for a very short time, she rested in, in this position. Then she began to sing in such sweet tones, Jesus is coming for me. Then her head fell against my right arm. The very dearest to me on earth had gone to be with Jesus. We hear a story like this. And there are countless stories like this. And in the natural, we think, what a waste. 
What a needless tragedy. Why, why, would, they, why would they waste their life like this? But Victor Plymer gave his everything to Jesus in Tibet as an act of extravagant worship. He took his bottle, broke it, and poured out the contents as an offering to the Lord. What was a waste in the eyes of people was an act of extravagant worship in the eyes of God. Listen, when you begin to worship God this way, I want you to understand this. There will be those that look at your life as you pour it out for God in extravagant worship and they will declare, they will look at you and say, what a waste! They could do so much more. They could be so much more. What lost potential. But I want you to know God sees it differently. Jesus said, this woman did a beautiful thing to me. What was a waste in the eyes of people was an act of extravagant worship in the eyes of God. The woman in the story broke the bottle, poured it out. The bottle was in pieces, couldn't be put to get back together again. There was no going back. And this is what Paul is talking about. This is the kind of worship Paul was talking about when he wrote in Romans 12:1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind you will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Pastor Jason, could you come on up? here? The question for us, we've already talked about it in the last few weeks. We will worship. We, are, we were made to worship. You will worship something. You will, whether it's yourself, whether it's money, whether it's uh, fame, whether it's popularity, whether it's relationships, whether it's sex, whether it's love, whatever, it doesn't matter. You will worship something, whether it's God. If it's not God, it'll be worship, you'll be worshiping some other created thing. The question is, will you allow yourself to be broken and poured out for Jesus? Are you willing to pay the price to become an authentic follower of Jesus? Are you, are you willing to pour out your life in spite of the criticisms that you will receive? Are you willing to completely surrender all that is you to God, even though others stand around and proclaim, what a waste? The question is, when it comes to God and your relationship with Him, will you live a life of extravagant worship? Will you give yourself to him in such a way that you say, God, my act of worship is to give everything and whatever you say, I'll do. Whatever, wherever you say go, I'll go. Whatever you call me to do, I'll answer. That is my act of worship. Far more than a song, far more than attending church, it's surrendering our lives to him. That is true worship. And just like the woman who broke the bottle, there is, there's no going back. There's no going back. Would you bow your head? Father, as we come into your presence, I do thank you, Lord, for this example of this woman who performed this beautiful act of worship. And Lord, I, I just pray, God, that it would serve as not only as an example, but also, God, as a challenge for us. And Lord, I pray that all of us in this room, that we would look at the lives of people who've gone before us, like we've looked at Lillian Trasher, and we've looked at Jim Elliott, we've looked at Victor Plymeyer, and there are countless others, oh God, that, that, that poured their lives out, and, and the world said, what a waste, what a waste, what a waste. But God, we want, we want our lives to be poured out for you. And God, I pray that you'd help us today to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice for you, Lord God. With, nobody's, with everybody's head bowed and nobody's looking around, I wonder uh, if there's those of you here today who would say, Pastor Dave, I don't, I don't even know that I'm there yet, but that's where I want to be. I want to worship Jesus that way. I want to pour my life out for him. I want my life to make a difference for eternity, not just for a lifetime. And you'd say, Pastor Dave, would you pray for me? I want, I want, to, I want to surrender that way. I want to worship that way. If that's you, just slip your hand up right where you are.
all over, the other hands all over the place, all over the place. If you're watching online, I just encourage you, respond to his word. Don't, don't just take it in as head knowledge. I've said many, many times in my life, when it comes to my relationship with Jesus and living this life, I, I want to die empty. I want to die empty. I, I want to give everything I've got for him. I, want, I don't want to be able to have to stand before him and say, there's something else I could give. I want to pour everything out. And that's, that's not a one-time decision. That's a decision we make today that we carry out every single day. Every moment when we're, cha- when we're forced with the, the, the decision to say, am I going to live for myself or am I going to live for him? Am I going to live for money or am I going to live for him? We make those choices as we move along. But I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, you see every heart, you see every life. There are so many of us, God, that are in this place that just simply say, God, I, I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to play church. I don't want to just do the right things. I don't want to just go through worship services. But God, I want my life to be radically changed. I want my life to be a radical, extravagant act of worship for you as I pour my life out for you, God. And as we do that, Lord, not only is it worship to you, but God, we become tools that you can use to touch the lives of others. And Lord, I ask that you would do that as we offer ourselves right now, Lord. We say, here I am. Send me, just like Isaiah did. And Lord, as we do, I pray, Lord, that as we place our lives on an altar and become and offer ourselves as living sacrifices. I pray, God, that tomorrow when we wake up, that you'd remind us that today is a day that we can serve you. Lord, I pray you'd help us to live our lives as acts of extreme and extravagant worship for you. And we give you praise in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.